It's amazing as we look at that hymn, there are some very important things in it tonight that will tie in with our message. Bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Those are things that relate to the church at Ephesus in our message tonight as we look into the promises of God and the warnings. Because you realize that as you look at the churches of Asia Minor, almost all of them have a warning given to them. That's rather significant. Nobody likes to listen to those kinds of warnings like we gave this morning in the message this morning, but there are some very significant warnings and some which I think apply directly to us here at Bible Presbyterian Church. We're over in Revelation chapter 2 tonight, and I'll start reading in verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now you remember we've seen that the seven stars are the messengers of the seven churches, or the angels of the seven churches, and the seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. So here he's writing to Ephesus. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and has patience. Notice that's the second time that that is mentioned in this text. And for my name's sake has labored. Again, he mentions that the second time. Up in verse 2, he said, And thy labor. And has not fainted. Does that sound like a pretty good church? A hang in there church? <laughs> it's a good church. But listen to what Jesus says. Remember, this is Jesus talking. Nevertheless, uh-oh, here it comes. I have somewhat against thee. And only one negative thing is mentioned. But what deadly consequences because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Repent for losing a first love. And do the first works. Oh, there's some works that relate to love. Listen. Listen. Or else I will come unto thee quickly. In other words, you don't have a lot of time to get your act together. And will remove thy candlestick out of his place. In other words, Jesus would shut the church down. Except thou repent. But to give them encouragement, he gives them one more positive. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Say, boy, I'm glad that was written to Ephesus and not to us. Oh, look at verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, so getting back to a first love is a matter of overcoming. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Here we are at the beginning of Revelation. We saw Revelation chapter 1 brought us back to the book of Genesis. And the very first letter to the seven churches brings us back to the Garden of Eden. 
if you overcome, overcome what? The loss of the first love. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. It's rather significant because you remember Adam and Eve had partaken of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and as a result had to be driven from the garden because God, speaking among the Trinity, the members of the Godhead, had said we've got to be sure that he doesn't reach out and take the tree of life and live forever. Can you imagine living continuously forever in the state of sin? But here, Ephesus is promised, and there's a different promise to each one of the churches. We'll see that as we go through the seven churches. But here, Ephesus is promised, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And remember, that is a letter written not merely to Ephesus. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I'd covered this briefly once before, but the seven epistles of Jesus, which is what these seven letters are, the seven epistles of Jesus are written not merely to those churches at that time, but to all the churches through this period in which we live. Because we see not just those seven churches, but we see throughout church history, in every period of church history, all seven types of churches expressed by what we see here in these seven churches in the book of Revelation. We're also going to discover as we move through the churches that each church really parallels very closely specific periods of church history. Ephesus is what you might call the apostolic church. It's the beginning church. It's the church where they've got their act together. But it's a church that's gone on for a little while, and suddenly they begin to lose something. Doesn't seem like they're losing their doctrine. Doesn't seem like they're losing their ability to exercise church discipline. Doesn't seem like it's, they're losing their, their zeal for Christ. But what they're losing is their love for Christ. What motivates their zeal? We're going to talk about that a little more in just a few moments. But last time we were in Revelation was on December 17th with the Son of Man vision. You remember we had on the 24th the Christmas candlelight service, then on December 31st, New Year's Eve special, and so that brings us tonight back to the book of Revelation. So we have covered basically five major areas in our last time together. First, after extensive study of the multiple passages we concluded on December 17th, with a final summary of the two distinct terms, the day of the Lord and the last days. Those are highly significant prophetic phrases in Scripture. Second, we saw that the day of the Lord refers to that period following the rapture and begins with the opening of the seven-year great tribulation that lasts until the end of the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. That's the day of the Lord. Third, in contrast, we saw that the term the last days began in the days of the apostles, and we're going to see some of that last day's stuff in Christ's letter to the church at Ephesus. It began in the days of the apostles shortly after Pentecost when compromise crept into the church. The last days starts at that point, and it extends all the way up to the rapture. Fourth, the last days are characterized by the apostasy of the church and the increased moral corruption both in the church and in the world. That's very clear in all those passages that we looked at related to the last days. And fifth and finally, the day of the Lord is characterized by five major elements, and of course each of these has many subparts, but the five major elements that we talked about related to the day of the Lord are number one, the day of the Lord is the wrath of God poured out on the sinful pagan world that has rejected Christ. Number two, the day of the Lord is a return to national Israel's time clock, which begins with that seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation or the time of Jacob's sorrows. 
We're also going to talk about it when we get a little further into the book. It's also the 70th week of Daniel. Number three, the day of the Lord is characterized by the absence of the church. Because the church has been raptured into heaven just prior to the seven-year great tribulation. Fourth, the day of the Lord is characterized by the second coming of Christ at the end of the great tribulation with its surrounding events. And believe me, there's a lot of stuff going on at the end of the tribulation. And we'll be talking about that as we get farther into the book of Revelation. But there are all kinds of events that take place when Christ comes back from heaven with us following him, Revelation chapter 19, and riding white horses coming back from the wedding feast of the Lamb to come down to earth to step on the Mount of Olives, to split it in half, as the book of Zechariah talks about, and to make an entry into the city of Jerusalem. The day of the Lord, number five, is characterized by the millennial reign of Christ and the consummation of all things at the great white throne judgment. And the day of the Lord encompasses at least 1,007 years. And we saw how there are multiple passages that support each part of that day of the Lord period. So uh, I hope you managed to get those things as we went through it. Now tonight, the Lord willing, we begin our study of the letters to the seven churches. These letters directly are from Christ to seven specific churches in Asia Minor, or what we know today as Turkey and Syria. Interesting, as we look at those areas, what has happened to the church? Total Muslim control. Annihilation of churches. No longer gospel witnesses or testimonies. That tells us something else, is churches don't always heed the warnings that Christ gives to us. Each letter, notice, the verse, first verse there says, to the angel of the church at Ephesus. Well, each letter is sent to the angel of a particular church. So the question is, who in the world is supposed to be receiving these letters? Well, the term angel in the English transliteration of the Greek word angelos, or the plural angeloi, that would be angels plural, it's a word that means a messenger. The one who carries the message of Christ in each case to each of the churches. You see, he writes to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Here are the things that are wrong with your church. So if Jesus was writing the letters today and he wrote to the angel of the church, the Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood, it would be addressed to me and he would give a list of problems that we have in our church. And with Ephesus, he says, if you don't get your act straightened together, you're going to get wiped off the map. you got a dead church, just like the dead Israelites in the wilderness, because they didn't get their act together and they kept complaining against God. Well, the church at Ephesus had a different problem. They weren't complaining against God. They were good guys. They were hard workers. But they'd lost something. They'd lost their first love. This word means messenger. And so the letters are addressed to the one who carries the message of Christ in each case to each of the different churches. The letters are not written by Jesus to spirit beings. Wouldn't make any sense. Jesus says uh, to John, hey, look, uh, I want you to send a letter to uh, a spirit being in Ephesus. I want you to send a letter to a spirit being in Pergamos or in Smyrna or in Thyatira, and so on. And now John wasn't writing the things down, carrying them to Ephesus, and hollering out, Spirit being in charge of this church, please read this letter. It came from Jesus. No, that's not what's happening here. The word messengers is often used in Scripture to refer to human messengers, or angel. The word angel, it's translated as messengers in other places in the New Testament, and I'll show you those in a moment. But it's not Jesus writing to some spirit beings. He's writing to the one who is the messenger, the one who carries the message to the church in each case. Let me give you some examples. First one is over in Matthew 11:10. If you want to uh, follow along, I'm going to start reading in verse 2 because it's referring to a very specific individual who is described for us in the text. And so we know that this refers to a real human being. We'll start reading in verse 2. Now, when John had heard in the prison of the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, 
Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now, of course, every thing that Jesus says there are given in the Old Testament as signs of the Messiah. These would be the hallmarks of the coming Messiah. Now, Jesus continues. The messengers go off, and Jesus continues. As they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, and this is out of Malachi, Behold, I send my angelos, my angel, my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So the word is clearly used of John the Baptist. In fact, it's used that way in three of the Gospels. Look over at Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Mark is going to present Jesus as the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before me. What is the word behind messenger? Who could guess? Angelos. Angelos, that's right. Behold, I send my angelos, my messenger, my angel, before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and girdled with a, skir a skin about his loins and he did eat locusts and wild honey and preached saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. John is again referred to, and it's the same kind of a context, though at the very beginning of John's ministry, when John is preparing the way for Christ. Still quoting that passage out of Malachi. Look over at Luke chapter 7, and we find twice here in Luke chapter 7, this term is used um, of human beings. Beginning in verse 19, And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and said unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things you have he seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the angeloi of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. So the term is not only used of John the Baptist, you say, well, he's sort of a special prophet. It's used of the men, and we're told in the other gospels it was two, who came to ask Jesus if he was the Messiah or should they look for somebody else. When the angeloi of John were departed, the angels of John were departed, so we know that it's not talking about John's spirit or something like that, because it's in the plural. He began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they were gorgeously apparelled and lived delicately or in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. Look at verse 27 and 28. Here we find again the same word used, but this time of John the Baptist. So used of John twice in the first two Gospels, then used of the messengers that John sent in verse 24 of Luke chapter 7. Now we find it used again of John. Verse 27. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my angelos before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, Among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God 
is greater than he. We find also over in Luke chapter 9, verse 52. And here we have the Apostle John speaking. They've, uh, he, he's sort of um, defensive of Jesus' ministry. He didn't want anybody else to horn in on this kind of activity. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. Verse 50. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent angeloi, sent angels, sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Now did Jesus send a couple of spirit beings into the village to scare the Samaritans to make sure that they were going to let Jesus into the village? Does anybody think that? Well, if so, they were pretty wishy-washy spirits because it says they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Can you imagine, for example, Michael and Gabriel with their swords stomping into the Samaritan village and saying, people, get ready, Jesus is coming. We want a good reception here. Get out the band. Uh, you better start playing. No. Jesus sent messengers into the village of the Samaritans. And, and you know the, the rest of the disciples are not very happy about this. Verse 54, And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? <laughs> we'll fix those Samaritans. These are good Jewish boys who didn't like Samaritans. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy lives, but to save. And they went to another village. Look again over at James chapter 2, verse 25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the angeloi, when she had received the angels, translated messengers, quite rightly so, and had sent them out another way. So the angels that we have, the angeloi, that are mentioned in the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, these are messengers. The question is, what kind of messengers? I think it should be obvious that they are the ones who are specifically responsible for delivering the message of Christ to each of the churches, what we would call the pastors of the churches or the elders in charge of those churches. The big lesson here is, and this is first a lesson for me, God holds pastors accountable for the spiritual condition of the churches where the Lord Jesus has placed them. Folks, that's a scary thought for me. I have no question that God brought me to this church. He used human instrumentality, quite obviously, but he brought me to this church. And now he holds me accountable for teaching you the truth and praying that by the will of God, you will obey the truth. Not me, the truth. That's why I try not to hold any punches back when it comes to things like why did God kill the children of Israel in the wilderness? And why did God kill the church at Ephesus? Let me give you an overview of the specific things before we get into all of these uh, seven churches. I'm going to give you an overview of each of the churches. Then we're going to come back to Ephesus. But let me give you an overview of the specific things that Christ wrote to each of the pastors of the seven churches and the message that they were supposed to pass on to their people in each of those seven churches. The first letter, of course, is to Ephesus, and we'll be saying more about this in a moment. But the key phrase, let me give you a key phrase for each one of the seven churches. The key phrase to the church at Ephesus is, love me more. Love me more. Someone has said the Ephesian church was better at enduring than endearing. <laughs> the, the Ephesian church was a church that hung in there. 
The Ephesian church was a church that gutted it out. But they'd lost something. They'd lost the joy, the delight of fellowship. They lost enjoying the presence of the Lord himself. They were so busy serving him that when he wanted to have fellowship with them, they were sort of shoving him aside because they were busy working for him. And they didn't want to spend time just sitting with Jesus. After all, there's work to be done. Folks, we have a lot of dear people like that around here. They're eager to serve. They do something. They've done it for the last 35 or 40 years. They've done it on clockwork schedule every year. They get out there and they whack it out. Ephesus was like that. But you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is the heavenly bridegroom. Here's a bridegroom writing letters to his bride. The church at Ephesus was faithful. Everybody wants their spouse to be faithful. Marriage requires faithfulness. But the issue here is not faithfulness. The issue here is intimacy. It's not just living in the same house. It's not just two ships passing in the night, but they have the same dock. It's about a close relationship between the heavenly bridegroom and his bride. You are part of the bride of Christ if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus. What he wants from you is a closeness, an intimacy, a real love relationship. Not merely a certificate that says, on such and such a day, so and so trusted Christ and was baptized and was received into membership at the Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood, New Jersey. And you hold up the certificate, like we passed out certificates this morning. You hold up the certificate and say, see, I got the certificate. He's not looking for the certificate. He's looking for the closeness. He's looking to spend time with you. When we get to Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. He wants to spend time with you. You know, people that you love are people whom you are delighted to spend time with. You know, I always say, okay, you got five minutes, uh, and uh, I've got the, you know, pretty tight schedule here, so, uh, you know, list all the things that uh, are bothering you right now. I'll see if in two minutes I can give you a quick answer to each one of those, and then I'm out of here. You don't treat people that you love that way. Now, I know sometimes you're under pressure, sometimes you've got to move it, but, you know, those of you who courted at one time or another, did you enjoy spending, and I'm not going to ask you about now, because who knows what happened between then and now, you know. But when you were courting, did you enjoy spending time with the one you loved? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would hope that every one of you who's been married would say, yeah, when we were courting, we enjoyed spending time together. And it could have been trivial things, you know, just walking around shopping or you know, sitting down and chatting about whatever idiot things that young couples chat about, you know. Jesus says to Ephesus, I'm looking at your church, and I sense there's a, a loss. When you all started out, we had an incredible relationship. And you've got all the mechanics down, as time has gone by, you have understood what I told you to do. And you have put it into your memory chip and it knocks it out day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, and you're still cranking it out. And you keep on going even though you're in a lot of trouble a lot of times. You keep on going. You keep hanging in there. But 
why are you doing it? I have the sense that you don't love me anymore. It's interesting that that is the very first indictment against any of the seven churches because that is a thing that Jesus is most concerned about in every church. Oh, there are other problems, and we're going to see all kinds of things like the false prophetess Jezebel and all that, and there are kinds of horrible problems in some of the other churches. But the first thing he dealt with, he could have sent a letter to any of the other churches first. He didn't. He sent it to the church at Ephesus. And the first thing that had been lost that was damaging a church was its love for Jesus which had evaporated, which was no longer there. Are you intimate with Christ? How much time do you spend reading and meditating upon the Word of God? Asking the Lord to show you how this passage of Scripture relates to you. Because you love him, you want to obey him. That's why you want to understand scripture. Not, I'm going to work this out and I've got these seven points here. And you know, I'm really big on making points, this, that, and the other thing. But why are you doing it? Do you really love him and that's why you want to learn? Do you really love him and that's why you want to obey? Do you really love him and that's why you want to serve? Do you really love him and that's why you're willing to endure hardness? And Ephesus did. But Jesus says, I can see your heart. I know why you're doing it. And it's not because you love me. We're going to come back to Ephesus, of course, because that's our message for tonight. But let me give you some brief outlines of each of the other churches. Number two, Smyrna was the second church. Jesus wrote to Ephesus and said, love me more. To what he wrote to Smyrna, three words also, hang in there. Smyrna was undergoing some horrible, terrible persecution. They'd faced some opposition at Ephesus, but Smyrna was going through terrible times of persecution. They were being imprisoned. Some of them were being killed. Right now, we see this happening all over the world. There are thousands of Christians who are either about to be arrested if they can be caught, or they are in jail. Some of them are being beaten, and some of them are being murdered. And our news media almost never reports it, but if you follow Voice of the Martyrs or any of the other groups that report on what's happening worldwide to the body of Christ, you know that's happening right now. That's Smyrna. You know, when, when we read the Apostle Paul, Paul talks about how he is enduring light affliction. And then he lists all these horrible things like shipwrecks and beatings and stonings and, you know, a night and the day I've been in the deep and, you know, I've suffered at the hands of false brethren and I've suffered, you know, from the pagans. I mean, and he calls that a light affliction. And he says, the thing that bothers me the most, the thing that is most difficult for me is the care of all the churches. Paul thought getting beaten with rods wasn't as painful as trying to kick, kick care of churches. Being beaten 49 times save one, he thought that was a lot easier to take than putting up with some of the churches that he had to deal with. Smyrna. And Paul called his sufferings a light affliction. You know, if we, if we talk about light afflictions, we think about something like having a flat tire or uh, our light affliction is... You know, this cold weather here, you know, we're, we're having a problem. Our drain isn't working, for example. I mean, like for this morning when I took a shower, the shower drain apparently is frozen because the water began to build up in the bottom of the shower. And so, of course, I took a very short shower this morning. Hope no, none of you noticed that. Uh, but uh, took a short shower because the drain wasn't working. The water's working, but, you know, for the first five or six years that I was here, the water pipes in the bathroom always froze because although you all built that bathroom on the first floor so we could take care of grandma they didn't put insulation 
on the water pipes and their events that lead to the outside. So when the temperature dropped before, uh, you know, below freezing for three or four days, the pipes would freeze. And I would have to take a little electric heater and stick it down there underneath the crawl space of the bathroom just so I could have running water. So finally I got tired of it and I crawled under there and I put one of those electric wraps around the pipes uh, that when it reaches a certain temperature, I think when it reaches 40 degrees, then that little thing has a sensor in it and it runs electricity through it and it heats the pipes. So I put insulation and I wrapped the pipes down there. But I didn't think to do it to the drains. <laughs> so now, now, is that a big problem? Mm -mm. You know, that's the kind of thing that we as modern Americans think of as, you know, we're suffering there. We're not suffering what Smyrna suffered. So Jesus' message to Smyrna is, hang in there. The third church, also a very short message to them, and we'll talk about each of these churches, but I'm giving you an overview to see what Jesus is concerned about in the churches. Number three, keep your eyes open. That's Pergamum, Pergamos. Keep your eyes open. You see, they had been deceived. They were what has been called the deceived church. <laughs> yeah, they were very open-minded, so open-minded that their brains had fallen out. They were open-minded about new doctrines. You know, they loved the word, and he commends them for that. That's what's called the hidden manna when we look at Pergamos. But they were willing to dabble in and taste any and every doctrine, not realizing how dangerous different doctrines could be, and they were swallowing some of them whole. The pastor of Pergamos had an important job to do. He had to warn the people against new doctrines and not to go running after every spiritual fad that they would see. For us, the way we solve that problem is we study church history and we study theology and basic Bible doctrine so that we're grounded in the basics. The fourth church is the church at Thyatira. And Christ had a very important message for them. It's one that this church has heeded well in the past, but here's the message to the church at Thyatira. Check your associations. Check your associations. You see, Thyatira was a very tolerant church. They tolerated relationships with people who appeared to be spiritual but were living a double life. They were afraid to confront sin when it was right in their middle. They were compromisers because they feared rejection more than they feared deception. They had some false prophecy going on in their midst. And, you know, sometimes false prophets and those with fake spiritual relationships are not very easy to spot. There are specific ways to spot false prophets, and we'll talk about that when we get to the church at Thyatira. Fifth is the church at Sardis. Jesus had a two-word call to them, which is, wake up. Wake up. You know, Sardis was the dead church. Sardis had everything. They had the buildings, they had the gymnasium, they had the playground, they had the school, they had the cafeteria, and they probably had the bowling alley. Uh, they had a balcony. They had a humongous auditorium that seated 1,300 people. Well, you know, I'm making some parallels here, aren't I? But they were dead. They were dead. Wake up. We'll talk more about Sardis when we get to Sardis. Now, finally we get to a church that's close to us. It's right across the river. Philadelphia. <laughs> the church of Philadelphia. Of course, it wasn't this Philadelphia, but Philadelphia. The word that Jesus has for the church at Philadelphia is take it to the next level. You're doing well, but don't stop there. 
You may be weak, but Jesus is strong. You can take it to the next level. The Church of Philadelphia was pressing forward into new open doors that God had set before them. They hadn't yet fallen into staying in one rut. You know, there are messages from each of these churches that apply to us. They were looking for the next door that God would open for them, for ministry. Last church, Laodicea. Another church that has a message for us. The message of Jesus to the church at Laodicea was stay on fire. Stay on fire. You see, Laodicea, very much like Ephesus, they sort of balance first and last, and then two and six balance out a little bit, and three and five and four is in the middle, and sort of a teeter totter kind of arrangement. But Laodicea had cooled down, they'd lost their fire. Their focus had turned from Christ to the world. They had a lot of wealth at Laodicea. They had turned toward pleasure. They were busy climbing the ladder of success. Jesus says to them, start your workouts again. Rekindle your energy. Fire up the routine and the schedule. Get motivated. Get rid of the cobwebs. Because your best days in serving Christ are yet ahead of you. You know what? That's what I think the Lord Jesus Christ would say to us as well. Now let's go back and look at the church at Ephesus for just a moment. The church at Ephesus was a doctrinal church. As you look at the book of Ephesians, you see that it is one of the two most important doctrinal books in the New Testament. The book of Romans, the book of Ephesians. Those are your two key doctrinal epistles. When you look at Ephesians, it's only six chapters long. But it starts eight out with what we would call Reformed theology. In fact, the whole first three chapters are doctrinal chapters. The last three chapters, four, five, and six, are practical application of doctrine. So they not only knew what was true, they knew how they were supposed to apply the truth. The church at Ephesus was a, not only a church that had a lot of knowledge, but the church at Ephesus also understood things about the spiritual gifts. The church at Ephesus also understood things about the fruit of the Spirit. The church at Ephesus also understood things related to spiritual warfare. That's chapter 6. As you look at the book of Ephesus, uh, the book of Ephesians, something else comes to mind, I hope. As you look through the seven churches, do you find any epistles other than this one here in Revelation? Do you find any other epistles in the New Testament written to mm, the church of Thyatira? Do you find any epistles written to the church at Laodicea? Uh, any epistles written to the church at Sardis? Any epistles written to the church at Philadelphia? You don't find any other of the seven churches who actually had a letter from the Apostle Paul that is part of the New Testament. There's a letter to the church at Colossae. There's a letter to the church at Philippi. But we don't have a letter to Thyatira. You see, Ephesus had a lot, and because of that, Ephesus was accountable for a lot. To whom much is given, from him shall much be required. Jesus set that principle down. We have been given a lot here at Collingswood. And to whom much is given... From him shall much be required. The more you have, the more accountable you are. The more gifts that God has given to you, the more responsibility you have to deal with the gifts that God has given you. Ephesus was a doctrinal church. 
They knew their doctrine. I mean, if you just open up chapter 1, you find six times the doctrine of election in chapter 1. I mean, they understood the sovereignty of God. They understood that God was not capricious. They were serving God with everything they had. You know, it said they were hard workers. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. Jesus didn't overlook the fact that they'd worked hard for him. He says it down again in verse 3. He says, And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and not fainted. This was not a lazy church. This was a diligent church. This was a church where everybody said, we're standing in the gap. We're fighting the war. We're carrying on. We are hanging in there. We participate in everything. Those are good commendations, and Jesus says so. Those are things that should characterize every church. He says, yes, I know your works, your labor. I know your patience. Now, some of you have heard me say the difference between patience and long-suffering. What is the difference? I'm going to ask a question. Somebody's got to be able to remember this. What is the difference between patience on one side and long-suffering on the other side? Patience is putting up with difficult circumstances. Long-suffering is putting up with difficult people. <laughs> Ephesus was able to put up with difficult circumstances. That word tells us that Ephesus was going through some tough times. Because Jesus says it twice, that he knows their patience. And for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. You have, you're a good church. You're hanging in there. He also gives them another commendation. He says, you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. This was a church that didn't back down from confrontation. This was a church that when somebody came in carrying some kind of a new doctrine and saying, I'm an apostle of Jesus, and here's what Jesus has to say to your church. They said, just wait a minute. Let's sit down here. Let's examine it according to Scripture. Let's examine it according to the epistles that the apostle Paul wrote to us. We'll see what he said in his letter. We know that he was an apostle appointed by, out of time, born out of due time. Let's see what it says. in Let's look at some of the other letters that he's written. Let's look at the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's examine scripture with scripture. Let's see if this complies with what was foretold in the Old Testament. There's a church that examined people who claim to have new doctrine. I hope this church is like that. I know when I came here as the candidate for this pulpit, I was examined for nine hours. Because of my background was not Bible Presbyterian. Another gentleman who pastor is an international church over in the Philadelphia area, was examined for about 10 minutes. Another young man who was seeking to get credentials to preach was examined for about 15 minutes and couldn't answer some very basic questions, especially in relation to creation. He didn't even know what he believed about creation. We got a license to preach. Folks, the examinations are important, and I'm glad I got examined that way, and that they pushed me on all the major issues. They wanted me to, to see if I knew the history of Bible Presbyterian denomination. They wanted to know what I believed in terms of uh, theology proper, systematic theology. They wanted to know my background in Greek, my background in Hebrew, my background in church history. I got examined in all the major areas by the members of the presbytery, and I stood up there in front of them, and they examined me and examined me and examined me and examined me. Ephesus was like that. That's good. You don't want to get somebody in who's a, a Mickey Mouse or flip-flop or wishy-washy or a compromiser. 
someone who doesn't believe the truth, someone who denies the deity of Christ, virgin birth, bodily resurrection, substitutionary atonement, inspiration of scripture, and creation, fiat creationism. I mean, there are a lot of things that, that you need to know for sure about a person. That's why we have examination of people who want to join the church, why they have to be here for a while, why they have to interact with the people in the church so that people here can get to know them or see if they are infiltrators who are coming in to somehow pollute the church or take it over. That happens all the time in churches all over the United States. You see, Ephesus was a good church. You say, man, that, that does sort of sound like us. I mean, that's, that's a good church. You've not fainted. I mean, you know, people dropping right and left around us, people dying like crazy here, but you guys still hanging in there. But verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Don't you remember it? Can't you think back to the time when you fell in love with Jesus? Can't you remember? He says you'd better. Remember your first love. Remember from where you've fallen. How intense was your love here? And where are you now? Down in the sub-basement somewhere. You're still running all the machinery. You're still doing all the equipment. You're still doing all the stuff. But why are you doing it? All kinds of motivations. Can be personal pride. Can be power. Can be, well, I've always done it that way, so I guess I've got to keep doing it that way. The only motivation that Jesus accepts for his service is love. That's the only reason he accepts what we do for him, is if we do it because we love him, not merely because, oh, well, i got to do it because God says so. The only reason that God accepts our labors on his behalf is our love for Christ. I hope we learn that because if we don't, if we don't repent and go back to where we started, he says, I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Individual repentance has to take place, but corporate repentance also has to take place because this was to the church at Ephesus. Corporate repentance is comprised of many individuals who repent. And remember, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So if there is one who does not repent, that leaven will again begin to work in the lump and destroy the lump. It's a serious warning to the church. can't believe our time is up. There's a lot more here in Ephesus, but we'll have to pick that up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight with humbled hearts, confessing our sins, and repenting of our loss of our first love. Every one of us at some point has been doing things for reasons other than our love for Christ. Father, we confess that is sin, individually and corporately. We pray that you might rejuvenate us once again that you might give us that thrill of love for Christ as we understand that he first loved us and that's why we love him and not just take his love for granted because he still loves us infinitely, compassionately, faithfully. 
He's still there for us, no matter when we fall, no matter what our trial, no matter what our suffering or our sorrow. He's always there with love and kindness and tenderness and compassion. Teach us, Father, to love him more. Cause our love to surpass even our first love, to grow and abound and be reflected in all that we do. And let that be our motivation for our service, not merely something that sits on the sidelines as we go about our activities but leave Jesus out. We know, Father, he wants to fellowship with us. He wants us to spend time with him in the word and in prayer and thinking about the things that he has done for us and giving him thanksgiving. Teach us, Father, what it means first to truly love and then help us to love Jesus with all of our heart and soul and strength and mind. For that is the first and great commandment. We are to love the Lord our God. And the second is like unto it, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Father, we pray that you will not remove this candlestick from its place but you will remind us, bring us back to that memory of the first love and restore it to us. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.